So, so we're, we're into the, uh, the work and energy section for rigid bodies. We did one example last class. And we expanded that idea for kinetic energy where I added this new term, right? The 1 half ig omega squared. So I want to introduce another thing that we're going to expand in the section for rigid bodies. And that's this idea here. You're familiar with a lot of these forces that do work, right? So if you apply a force and the force is pulled at a certain angle with the horizontal, for instance, we have something like an F cosine theta times a ds. We know weight already. We've seen it. Uh, MGH or MGY, essentially. We know spring. We know kinetic friction. So the one that I'm going to add today is this idea that we can even have moments, because now we're rotating rigid bodies, moments can also do work on this rigid body. The problem is with moments, when you think about when you're twisting a disk, right, we need to figure out how do we apply this equation, the force times the distance. It's not clear right away how you get a distance from a rotation unless you start thinking about arc lengths and how much distance a point travels in an arc. So that's exactly what we're going to do. I also note here this really, really important point. As we draw free body diagrams, right, you should be very, very careful for rigid bodies where the arrows you're drawing go and what, and what specifically is the line of action of that force. And so I made a point about that last class when we did a falling disk. The MGH that I use, the weight, Notice where the line of action for this force is. The line of action is through the center of mass. Right? So that matters greatly because if an object starts to spin on you, right, it's not, you, know, you don't start with the top of that rigid body because if it starts spinning and moving down due to gravity, that point is, is going to be not the point that you want for gravity. You want to focus on the center of mass. So I'll, I'll give you an, an extra note here. This is through the center of mass g. And that's critical. Everything else is self-explanatory, right? Friction is where the, uh, the rigid body makes contact with a surface, right? Spring is always going to be in this particular course acting along just one line, which is the linear, uh, the, the, the line through the linear spring, right? So all that's fine. Let's focus on moments for a bit. So if I have a moment, we're going to call this a coupled moment. The idea is as follows. I'm going to take a rigid body in two dimensions, and I'm going to find its g. And basically, I'm saying there's just a moment like that around g. And I want to know how much work is being done. So the way we view this moment is you think about everything we know about moments about O. This equation should just be an RO cross F. And so everything is buried in this m. How do I replace this m with an r and an f? The way to do that is we redraw this diagram, and we call it a couple moment, because the moment can essentially be broken up into two forces. So if I draw a line through this, it's essentially like a force here, like an f, and another force here. But in order to maintain that it is a magnitude of f times r, it's basically like the distance between these two f forces must be a total of r. So this is like an r over 2, and this is an r over 2. OK, just think about that for a second. Right? This is the same setup as if I did f times r, and the point of rotation was down here. But I moved it to the center, so it's r divided by 2. OK? So if everyone gets that, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make this my point. My point G again. And I'm going to now displace it with a little bit of rotation. So if I displace it, here's what happens. This straight line would have rotated. It's going to rotate like this. And that rotation creates an angle. This angle is a d theta. Okay. And this point that was originally here has now moved over to this point. And so the distance traveled is that arc length. So what is that arc length right there? That arc length is 
traveled by f is r over 2 d theta. Okay, r over 2 d theta based on this distance here, and this is effectively our ds. Okay, so imagine we do a rotation. We can do a rotation for as, as large of an angle theta as we need, but that would be the moment doing work. And so now I can convert my work equation, this one right here, into a form that makes sense for moments. Here's what it would look like. Okay, so effectively, if I, if I wanted, if I wanted a total work done by moment, total work done by m, this would be like an integral of all of my little bits of dum, and this is like an integral of my force times a distance. So it would be my f times my ds's. And so how do I do my f ds in this case? There's one force multiplied by a d, an r over 2 d theta. Okay, And that was just one of the forces. I now have to multiply this by 2 like that. Okay, so two of those forces, but half the distance, the twos cancel. It gives me an integral of f r d theta. And that means that our limits of integration, now we can fill it out with this d theta. It's basically like from one theta to another, like a theta 1 to a theta 2. And knowing that f dot r is exactly the same as the magnitude of our moment, I can now write this like the following. U m is effectively an integral of the moment that you apply times the d theta. Okay, and so I'll put a box through this, uh, around this, and then if moment is constant, then it becomes even easier. Work done is basically a capital M multiplied by the change in angle theta 2 minus theta 1. OK? So a new formula for you to use if we happen to include some coupled moments into the problem. Let's do a quick check on units. Energy or work, units of joules. Moment, we know this to be a newton times a meter. And radians for all the angles. So guess what? Our newton meter is exactly the same as a joule, right? So check, that works. OK, so that's the second new thing in the rigid body section for work and energy. Let's do a quick example. So here's my example with a coupled moment. Let's do the following here. Okay, so I've got I've got a fixed point O and then a big flywheel, so just a heavy disc. And I've got a block A hanging from a rope that's round, uh, wound around the flywheel. And it's actually initially sitting on the ground. And we'll say that this is S is equal to 0. You know what? Let's make it, uh, let's make it level with the ground. S is equal to 0. OK, so here's what we're going to do. This is a 
real. We're going to apply a coupled moment, so an MO, and we're going to give you the coupled moment. The MO is going to be a constant of 120 kilonewton meters. And that's a constant. And we know a few things. I'm going to give you the outer radius of the real. I'll give you the weight, the real. So this is m real g. It's 30 kilonewtons. And the weight of the block A. Okay, and you're told that everything starts at rest. So the VA, the velocity of the block initially, so VA1 is equal to 0 at S is equal to 0. And then you're told that as this thing winds around the, the, the reel, block A is going to move up. Okay? And you're told that at the position 2, S is equal to 4 meters. Okay? And notice that my 4 meters, I'm measuring from the bottom of the block right there. So my delta S is going to be 4 meters. And you're basically asked to find this. Find VA at the position 2. At the second position where the block has moved up that 4 meters, what is the velocity after all of this winding of the reel due to the coupled moment? OK, so this is, this is a really straightforward example just to, just to demonstrate the use of the moment and thetas and everything else. So we're going to go straight ahead to the solution. Obviously, we're going to do a principle of work and energy for rigid bodies. No surprise there. So let's do a T1 plus a sum of work 1 to 2 is equal to T2. Okay. Everything starts off at rest. Okay, so so far so good. And then, and then let's do let's tackle our, uh, our our kinetic energy at position two. So, so look at this system of, of 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 objects. We've actually got a rigid body and a particle, right? The particle is the is the a block a. We can treat that as a particle because it's just translating up. So very easily we know that at t two this would be our m a v a two squared, and there's our uh, there's our unknown, the VA2. And then I'm going to add that onto our, our kinetic energy for the real. Now that's a rigid body. So I'm going to have to do this, right? I O omega squared. And I'll put a 2 here. Right? So I'm going to need to find I O for the, the real. That's one piece of information I forgot to mention. Let's go back. I'm going to give you the radius of gyration kg. Okay. In other words, it's complicated enough. It's not really a disk. I'm just going to give you radius of gyration kg. Okay. And so that leads me to I O is mass of the real kg squared, and that will be one nine five seven kilogram per meter squared. OK, so that's known. This is not known yet. That's not known. And I've got to figure out what my work is. OK, so work. What is, the, what is the work done on the system? The work done on the system has to be distance traveled by block A, right? So minus MAG. 
And then position two top, oh, minus position one. S2 minus S1, right? OK. And then for the first time, we're going to use the coupled moment. There's an applied moment around the reel. And we know that it must be this constant MO. And it must be a delta theta. OK, so we know what delta S is. Delta S is 4 meters. We don't quite know what delta theta is, except for the fact that it's basically how much of the circumference is equal to 4 meters. That gives you how much angle has been, has been, has been uh, traveled, right? So we know the following. We know that delta S is actually r times delta theta, right? And so that gives us our delta theta. Delta theta would be 4 meters divided by 1.5 meters. So 2.67 radians. OK, and so now I'm going to plug everything in. So substitute into principle of work and energy, I'm going to get 0 plus here. So it'll be negative mag is 15 kilonewtons times 4 meters plus mo. And then delta theta. Okay, and that will be equal to my one half, and then that energy in at position two right there. So it'll be fifteen thousand newtons divided by the nine point eight one to give me mass. VA2 squared plus 1 half IO, this is 1957, omega2 squared. OK, and we still have two unknowns, but guess what? This omega for the real angular velocity is basically the same as VA at the edge of the reel. So that's where we can link these two. We can say VA2 is everywhere along the rope. Therefore, it must be the same as my V2 times R. OK? So if you solve this, you can just substitute one for the other, and you would get your solution. And so let me give you the final answer, omega2 is just going to be 9.82 radians per second. And then that leaves VA2 as that times 1.5, 14.7 meters per second. OK, so that's how you would incorporate a coupled moment into work. How did I get VA2 as omega 2R? So, so this goes back to our kinematics. Here is my VA2, is the velocity of the rope and the block. Everything is the same. So it would be basically the edge of this reel. That's my VA2 upwards. And that is related to omega R, because this is my R. So it's just the, the, the outer velocity, the, dis, the velocity of the outer rim of the, the reel. OK, any other questions? Let's do, let's do one more example here. Let's go over here.
Okay. Okay, so we have, we have a, your textbook problem here, 30 degree incline disk rolling up the incline being pulled by force P. Okay, pretty, pretty simple stuff. But you know, for the first time, we're actually going to have to really draw a free body diagram in this chapter. All the other ones were so simple, we didn't even have to draw one. So let's draw our FBD. Okay, so here's where that message that I told you about at the beginning of the class, lines of action, this is critical, right? We have to make sure that we draw our lines where we want them. So I'm going to draw my MG straight down through the center of gravity G. Uh, one other thing here, did I tell you it was rolling wheel without slip? Yeah, rolling wheel without slip as usual. So rolling without slip. Okay, so there's our point A, and yes, we have some friction force down here, but it's going to be static. So I'm just going to put FF static. And then what else? We have a normal force. Normal force acts through this way. And we have a force P that acts right at the edge. Okay, so there's our free body diagram, and looks to me like G moved, there's a displacement, displacement's velocities, we're going to use principle of work and energy again, All right, so we're going to do that, and T1 is zero, because omega naught is <coughs> angular velocity initially at rest, or zero, and then so we have these two that are left, right? The T2 and the sum of the, the work done. OK, so same thing. Let's take a look at T2. So T2 of this rolling disk, it's going to be our rotation and translation, essentially, of the disk of a wheel rolling without slip. And what did I say before? I said that the easiest way to do this is this is always true. It's always I, I, C, omega squared. It's only troublesome when you have an I, C that moves all over the place. In this case, we're guaranteed that the I, C is point A. So this is 1 half I, A, omega squared. What's I, A? I, A, this point, is really going to be parallel axis theorem of the disk but shifted by an extra radius. So our IA would be IG plus MD squared. But this is the same as 1 half MR squared plus MR squared. So that's 3 halves MR squared. OK, so T2 is 1 half times 3 halves mr squared times omega squared. And then so what we're going to do, we're going to do our work now. So four forces on your free body diagram. Two of them do no work. Static friction, no work. Right? Because there's no displacement for, all, for, for static friction. F Newton, uh, sorry, F normal. Basically zero because it's perpendicular to your displacement the whole time. So the only two forces that do work are mg. So it's going to be negative mg. And the distance traveled is one meter up the incline. But the y is going to be the sine 30 degrees. OK, so it was one meter up the incline, but with the trig, it's sine 30 gives you the total vertical distance up. So that's your gravity. And then it's going to be added to 
my p force, which is 50 newtons, multiplied by distance traveled by p. What should the distance traveled by p be? One meter. All right? Good? No, not good. Is it really one meter? G is one meter. How far does the rope travel at the top of the wheel if my G traveled one meter? Right, two meters. Okay, why two meters? So let me prove it to you. Very simple demonstration here. But what I'm going to do is I've got, a, so I've got a, a tape measure here. And if I put my disc right here, just watch as my hand represents this ribbon at the top of the wheel. And the center point is right here at the disc. I'm going to try to pull this disc so that it ends up at two feet, 24 inches, and you tell me where my hand ends up, okay? So it's going to be right here, like that. And my hand ended up at four feet when the center of mass of the wheel ended up at two feet. Okay? So it is actually double whatever my G point moved, right? So why is that the case? What's that? Yeah, I'm moving, I'm moving at the circumference of the wheel. But more importantly, this, this, agree, this should agree with everything that we know about drawing our omega r's, right? When you think about it, every time we roll without slip, here's our ic, right? And here's our vg, right? And wouldn't you say that this vg has always been omega times 1r, right? But what happens at the very top? Well, this is double the distance. This is 2r. So if this is our IC, guess what this, omega, uh, this, this V is? This V is omega 2R, right? So, so the diagram agrees. It tells us that the velocity, the speed of that point at the top of the disk is traveling twice as fast. And so for the same amount of time, it travels twice the distance. And so what did I say about line of action? This P has a line of action right there. When I take into account the work, the work is the displacement of that particular force. So I have no choice. It must be two meters. Otherwise, your answer would be wrong. OK? So that's, that's critical, right? That's sort of the main message of this problem, is don't forget where your forces are going. And don't forget the distances of these forces. So I'm going to now give you the final numbers. That's going to be. Uh, yes, this is negative 49 plus 100. So this is 51 joules. And so what we have is 0 plus 51 joules is equal to that 1 half, 3 halves mr squared omega squared. And therefore, omega, omega works out to 13 radians per second. And the question asks for what? The velocity of g. So now I'm going to move back to g. This must be equal to omega times 1r. And so that's 2.6 meters per second. Any, any questions on that? Yeah. Oh, because the, the question asked you for VG, right? Not, not this one. If I asked you for V of the top of the disk, then it would be 2R. Anything else? No? Good? OK, so rotational energy, moments lines of action of these forces. We did a few examples. So the next one we're going to do is
conservation of energy. Right? And guess what? Nothing has changed. Everything is the same, except you just got to take into account all the rotational energy that you might have in the system. So you're going to be using this. That's it. Exactly the same thing, except now your T1s and your T2s clearly are a bit different. They're gonna, you're going to make sure that they account for rotations. Your V1s and V2s, if you have gravity involved, the Hs, the MGH1H2, better be through the center of mass. Everything else is the same, right? So let me drive home that point with another example. See if I can squeeze this one in here. So let's do a uh, pin and a slender rod. And I'm going to have, let's do here. And the slender rod has a disk on it. Oops. OK, so, so here's my diagram. Here's my problem. It's kind of like a pizza cutter, OK? Cutting pizza. So picture it as a slender rod, and it's attached to a big rolling disk. And it starts off at this vertical position. And the whole disk is going to roll down this arced surface. And I'm going to ensure that this disk rolls without slip. So I'm going to point to that. I'm going to say that's an IC. In fact, I'm going to first call it point D. I'm going to say point D rolls without slip. OK? So that's an IC all the way. And here are my other locations. Here's G of my slender rod. Point A is my fixed point. And point B is the center of the disk. OK? And this is called my wheel C. Wheel C. OK, so some data. So I'm going to give you length of the slender rod, LAB, 16 centimeters. Radius of the wheel is half of that, 8 centimeters. Radius of gyrations, mass of the rod. Mass of the wheel. V1 is 0 at rest. Okay, typical Cartesian coordinates. Gravity acting straight down. You know the drill. OK, so we're going to ask something really, really simple here. You've got a system of these rigid bodies. And all we really need to know is, if I give you this initial velocity, I'm just curious to know what is the final velocity. So find VB, which is the point of the center of that disk, and omega AB, so the rotation, the angular velocity, after 90 degree rotation of the rod, so now vertical, right? Now vertical. Uh, 
OK, so look, again, perfectly textbook problem for conservation of energy. I don't have any really interesting work terms that I have to deal with here, no coupled moments, uh, no friction because its instantaneous center is at that point, so rolling without slip. So textbook case. It's just a matter of keeping track of your T1s, V1s, T2s, and V2s. Okay? And so what should I do here? I'm going to do something where I just basically say the following. I'm just going to write this out once. T1, V1, T2, V2. And everything's at rest. This is 0. Okay. And I'm going to do it in such a way where after it falls down to this vertical position, maybe I say that it's lost all its potential energy. So I, I crossed out V2 in my notes to just say that my datum line is when the thing is vertical. Okay? So there's a bit of a trick there. What that means is this is my datum line. This is my y is equal to 0 for the disk. But then I've got to be careful here. This is my g for the slender rod. Right? So this is kind of like my other y is equal to 0 datum line for the slender rod. That's a minor detail. Let's just do the math. Okay? So again, just keep track of your, of your work, of, your, of all your energies here. Okay, so let's see if we can do this. Potential energy of everything. So it should be this. M A B G H A B. Okay? And the H A B, because of the way I've defined my potential energy, that would be this G above this line. That's half the rod, right? So half the rod, I'm just going to replace this. This is just. 0.08, that's half the rod. And then for point B, it's like this. If I did m of the wheel, mc times g, the full drop is the whole length of the rod. This one's going to be my 0.16. Okay, And I've got the two different masses. So I can do a quick calculation here and satisfy that it is be satisfied that it is 6.91 joules. Okay, And then T2, this is the big one. Everything is moving now. Okay, And so how do we deal with this? Here's what it comes down to. It's going to be 1 half, so let's do the disk first. Disk rolling along IC, so this is going to be I I C omega squared, and this is my omega C squared. And then I have to add that to one half of the slender rod rotating. So what's the easiest way to do slender rod rotating? I do the same thing. I pick my A point because that's my fixed point of rotation. So that's kind of like an IC as well. This gives me IA omega AB squared. OK? So that's great. I just want to make it clear, though, right? The slender rod swinging down from fixed point A, you could have easily replaced this if you wanted to. This could have been replaced with a 1 half MVG squared plus 1 half IG omega squared. And I proved to you last class that this was exactly the same thing, right? So this could have been used if you wanted to, but I'm going to use my IA. Okay, so that, that means that I'm forced to determine my IA. IA is going to be MABLAB squared times a third because it's slender rod at the end. I'll give you the number for that. And the IIC for position D, right? This is position D. Okay? 
So what did we do last time? Remember we did the disk and we just moved it to the, the edge of the disk, right? So in this case, uh, the wheel is a bit more complicated. You're actually given a KC. So radius of gyration, that would be at center of mass G. And then we move it. So MCR squared, like that, OK? I'll give you that number. OK, and then so finally, I'm going to put everything together. 6.91 joules on the left, plus all of this stuff. So 1 half 0 0.02048 times my omega slender rod squared. One half zero point zero three two omega c squared. Okay, so what do I do now? I've got two unknowns. One thing is rotating at omega a b. The other is at omega c. What should I do? So this one right here, this is swinging down at omega AB. Is that, does that give you a clue? So what, what, is, what is the point where they're both uh, sort of overlapping? Or which point do they have in common? The point that they have in common, VB. So VB, if you look at that velocity at the end of that slender rod, it must be an omega AB. LAB, but at the same time, from the disk's perspective, VB is just what? It's measured from the VIC, right? So it would be essentially omega C times RC. And this is from rolling without slip. And so now you plug this in, substitute, solve for VB. That's it. VB is 1.54 meters per second. And what else did I ask for here? Omega AB. Plug that back in there. Nine point six three. All right. Lots and lots of examples today. Covered a lot of ground. Any final questions? No? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. So a couple minutes left, just a quick reminder. Have you guys received an email about course evaluations? Not yet? OK, so, so I've received that email, and I've, I've put together some extra questions uh, on my teaching and instruction of this course. But the questions that you're going to see are going to be both the course material and also my instruction in this particular lecture. Really, really do appreciate it if you can complete that course evaluation, because it really helps our teaching and delivery of the course. Right? So if you see that email. Click on it. Should take about five, five, six minutes. Um, please do your evaluations, and I'll keep reminding you guys to do so. All right. See you guys on Friday.